what they're called? Uh, it's the hostage crisis negotiation team. Okay, so when there's not a hostage involved, like well, I'm talking about Friday, there wasn't a hostage involved, it's just you're a crisis negotiator. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm referring to the title correctly. Yeah, all, all, all of them are somebody's in crisis, yeah. but you're there to negotiate a peaceful resolution. Okay. Um, what are some of the challenges in a situation where you have someone who is armed and in a barricade situation and been in there for several hours? What are some of the challenges um, in resolving that peacefully? Well, any time that you're called out to a scene like that, um, the biggest challenge, whether it's gone on for hours or a short period of time, is, is building some type of connection with that person uh, to help them understand that you are there solely to make sure they're okay. And so you have to build upon, it's like building a relationship with someone in a very, very short amount of time. So the longer it draws on, hopefully the more time you get to develop that rapport and get to communicate with that person effectively. How do you get in contact with that person? If that person's inside a room, how do you start talking to them? Do you call their cell phone? Do you radio in? How do you, how do, you do that? Typically, if we've been called out to a scene, there is something that has happened that has led to that. So either they had an argument with someone or something has led them in some way. So based on what information we have, we begin the process of trying to find an effective way to communicate with them. Sometimes it may be through a cell phone. Sometimes it may be just us yelling outside, hi, we're here, we'd like to talk to you. Uh, can you give us a call or can we call you? So it could be anything. There's been plenty of times I've talked to an empty building or something where we're talking, yelling or through a bullhorn. How important is that suspect's friends, their family in assisting you in convincing them, hey, you don't want this to end badly, you want this to you know, end peacefully, how, how important is that, having a friend or a fam close family member to, yeah. to help convince the suspect things are going to be okay, you don't want to, you know, we want this all to end well? At that time, they're, they're in crisis. You know, everybody handles situations different. What may affect you may not affect them, uh, it affects them differently. So anytime that you have any type of outside information or somebody that has a relationship with this person, it, it gives us more insight to know kind of that person better. And the more information that we have and the more helpful somebody is, it leads us to being able to communicate better with that person. It allows them to connect with us and hopefully and peacefully come out, see their family, their friends, and it allows them to know people are out there or people care about you. There's more going on than just right now in the moment that you're you're in distress. How do you build trust with a suspect um, so that they feel comfortable that they're not going to be ambushed or taken off guard? I mean, obviously, each situation is different. And in sure. some cases, you may be doing that. You may be running straight through the door. But how do you, how do you build trust with them? Well, one thing is, is not everybody that we come encounter with is a suspect. Um, there's people that want to harm themselves because they um, feel that they have nothing left to live for. So, you know, how we build trust or build communication with that person is almost the same way that anybody does when they meet somebody. You know, you have to listen first because if you can hear what is going on with them, then you can understand or try to see or empathize with where they're coming from. And then that allows you to communicate and talk to them and connect with them. So listening is, is one of the most important things and effectively communicating with, with them so that way they understand you're not trying to tell them what to do, you are just simply trying to be a friend. Mm -hmm. And if you hear them repeating the same concerns over and over again, you can find a way to um, allay those concerns to, to help them you know, feel more comfortable in the outcome or w what's going to happen next. Correct. When, when, when they're in the first process of whatever conflict or crisis they're going through, their emotions are all over the place. So a lot of times you do have them repeating themselves where you've already heard it, but they haven't understood that you really have heard them, you're listening to them. 
So just working them through it and hopefully bringing them back down to an emotional state that makes them a little bit more stable. And also you're, you're giving them instructions on how this is going to go so that they know we're going to be okay if you do this, but things are not going to, or I don't want to say it that way, but, you know, um, once you do this, we'll know that this is time for us to, to respond in this way. You know, if you come out with your hands up, then we'll know, you know, or if you put the gun here, we'll know that it's our, that we're okay to come forward or something like that. You, you're Absolutely. giving instructions. Absolutely. You're constantly reassuring them and, and giving them information and you're, you're repeating it because, again, somebody that's, that's in crisis or emotionally charged, they don't always hear what you're saying. So you, you want to pass that information over often and consist, constantly so that way when it does come to the point that they're coming out, you know, they have a clear understanding of how it's going to go and how the process is. Why do police in some situations go right through and enter the room and why in other situations is it more of a, a wait and let's see how this develops and let's monitor it and let's not go into the room and hope that this person comes out? Every case is, is so different and, and how one incident is handled, there could be <clears throat> information out there that some people don't know about it. Um, as a negotiator, our job, it's a team effort so even though you have someone that's, that's talking, we're focused on that. We're focused on the person and, and connecting with that person, getting that information, that a lot of times anything that's happening over here, we're not even a part of because our main focus is, is that. But each case, again, is, is different that if somebody's in danger or there's you know, uh, a chance or risk for, for life of the public safety, uh, that person, if they have somebody or officer safety, it may change how you approach a situation where if nothing is in play, you may talk for long periods of time. It's so general that there is no specific way to answer that. Right, it's case by case. Sure. Um, how do you protect, protect the safety of the negotiator who may be around the corner or maybe within eyesight or maybe they're, maybe they're intentionally not within eyesight? Can you talk about how are you going to protect the person who's, who's going to be talking to this person? Well, the Nova Police Department is very fortunate that our negotiation team and our tactical team, they work a lot uh, with each other. Um, every time that we train, we train as if it's real life. So knowing how each other works makes it able to keep us safe. So where if we do have to go down in a position where we're communicating through a door or out in the open, um, we try to take as best safety precautions as we can, and we rely on, on the officers and the, the tactile side to keep us safe so we can focus on that person because, again, our goal is to make sure that they know we care, they're safe, and we want it to come to a peaceful resolution. And regardless of what happens in the court system will happen outside of that incident. So you, you almost need to say, like, Whatever it is that you're troubled by, whatever it is you're worried about, we're going to deal with that later. Yep. My job, like, you as a negotiator don't care what they're charged with. You care about getting them out of the situation safely and, and ensuring the safety of the others around. You Correct. Know? You know, what they've done in the past, if we have that information, sure, we, we look at it. But we really don't care about their past. We don't care what's going to happen. We care for that person in that moment and we want to make sure again the public is safe that person is safe the officers are safe and however we can come to a peaceful resolution that's our key focus um how has social media changed this um uh, this job um, every day it seems that there's something that that's new coming so we've become a very technologically uh dependent world so as these social medias change where people are able to interact instantly, um, we can actually use that to communicate with someone. If we're unable to m get a hold of them through a bullhorn phone call, this could be a way that we communicate with them. So really, it opens up more options for us to learn about someone and to possibly communicate with them. So it does change things, but we can use it as tools to help us, really. Mm -hmm.